So before we uh, jump into today's stuff, I want you all to tell me a little bit about the visitors last week. What did you think? What did you get from, from Dr. Skelton when he came? Mm-hmm. Okay, good, 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 good. So yeah, the Nationally Competitive Scholarships Office is something that you all definitely need to be taking advantage of uh, if you want to uh, participate in those things. We're actually quite good at getting students across the finish line and being successful in things from, and he probably talk, told you all about those different pieces, but you know, for, for chemistry majors and other science majors, we're, we're typically talking about the Goldwater, the NSF, uh, those types of things. Those are the kinds of scholarships that you're going to want to compete for even if you already have a full ride um, because those scholarships on your resume will be what gets you into the door at a variety of places um, believe it or not. So uh, folks that have a Goldwater scholarship listed on the resume for medical schools, for dental schools, for graduate school, whatever the case may be for you all, even a, just if you all just decide to go get a job when, when you're finished with here at USM, that'll be one of the things that will help make you stand out because they only give out so many of those. Every university is only allowed so many nominees. I think it's four. I can't remember. Uh, so there is an internal competition and being selected as a finalist in and of itself is a uh, honor to uh, share with your um, to share on your on your resume and CV, which we're going to talk about resumes and CVs today. Then um, career services came by, right? And so, what did they talk to you all about? One of the main points was we were talking about like career fairs and how we talked in good depth about resumes and how most people only look like about nine seconds on average. Yeah, that's what they, and it depends on the type of employer. Uh, I would say in the academic world, we spend a little more time than that. Uh, but he's, you know, I can't remember who came, do you remember, was it, was it a he or a she that came and talked? Uh, she. she. She, okay, so it wasn't, it wasn't uh, Mr. Anderson. Um, so I don't, I don't know that individual personally. Um, but they're probably right. If you're going to a career fair or something like that, um, they probably look through for those things very, very quickly. And imagine if they're looking through your stuff very, very quickly and they see something like Goldwater or NSF Fellowship or Gilman or Truman, uh, one of those highly competitive and highly sought after <coughs> awards, they're gonna stop on your resume, okay? Uh, regardless of what else is on it, they're gonna stop at that resume and, and pay it a little bit more attention. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, you might be thinking, I've got four years left before I finish here. Why do I need to be worried about career services? Why do you need to be worried about career services as a freshman or sophomore? Uh, you want to stay prepared and ready for when you do start going. That's right. That's right. You want to stay prepared. You want to stay connected in. You might think of that as being um, networked. How many of you all have a LinkedIn account? Okay, one or two of you have a LinkedIn account. You all need to have a LinkedIn account. Uh, it is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's basically the Facebook for the professional world. You do not want to depend on your uh, public face being, you know, your social media face based on your Instagram account or your Facebook account. Many of you have things on your Facebook and Instagram accounts that will get you avoided from a job. I mean, it's just a fact of life. Certain pictures can get you uh, basically ignored at a company. Uh, it, it's, whether it's right or wrong is irrelevant at this point. Um, since it is freely available, I can guarantee you each and every 
uh, employer and committee for your uh, for for your uh, uh, next step step in life, whether it's medical school or graduate school or whatever, will look at what's publicly available. Uh, and if they see things that cause them concern, they can take that into consideration. You have put it out in the public, so it is very very important that you all right now start to think about how you're presenting yourself publicly. And I would highly recommend you to go through your social media accounts and start to remove some posts, some shares, some likes, um, and those types of things. And I know that that doesn't sound uh, appetizing to a lot of folks, but it is, it is true that there are a lot of things out there that uh, if, if an employer could, looks at and they'll just say, you know, this, this isn't the type of uh, activity that we want representing our company or our school or whatever the case may be, and they can move forward. Anything that you put out freely available to the public is not protected. You, you can't, it can be used to, uh, as part of the judgment of whether or not somebody wants to hire you. So that's important, and I hope they talk to you a little bit about that in career services. The other thing is, is that um, you really should start going to job fairs now. And I know you're thinking, again, well, I've got four years before I graduate. Why would I start going to job fairs now? Number one, that networking piece, starting to get uh, people interested in who you are and what you want to do. But two, there's also the opportunity for internships. So you may not be looking for a job right now, but you may be looking for an internship in the summer. You may be looking for a summer job. And I guarantee you it is much better to get a summer job or an internship in the area you want to ultimately be in as opposed to whatever is convenient down the road at the mall or the fast food place or whatever. There's nothing wrong with those jobs and quite frequently they pay quite well. But the experience that you get from being involved in an internship or um, a, a, um, a related job to your field uh, will go a long way more than than the other jobs that you'll do that aren't, aren't related. And so just to tell you a little bit of a story, so when I was at the University of Arkansas, this was before I got married, I knew I was getting married so I knew I needed a job. <laughs> I had to be able to uh, support myself and my wife and I picked up back in those days, we had the phone book, you know, don't have the phone book anymore. But I knew that I didn't want to just get a job um, you know, down at the mall or something like that. I wanted to do something uh, in, in chemistry. I was a chemistry major after all. And so what I did was I picked up the phone book and I looked under analytical laboratories and there was, uh, a, um, you know, the very first one in the phone book was environmental services company and it was just down the road. And I picked up the phone and I called them, told them who I was, told them I was a chemistry major at the University of Arkansas and that I was looking for a part-time job. And the guy said, you know what, interesting you called. He said, we have, we have an opening, come down and come talk to me. I put together a short resume, it was about two pages long. I put on my best dirty shirt, so to speak. Uh, and you know, I didn't have a suit or anything at that point. So I, I, I dressed up as best I could. I went down and I met him. His name was Ford Benham. We sat down and we talked. He took an interest in me and he hired me. And so I had a job that was about 25 hours a week uh, on average over, over the course of a month and uh, I was actually doing analytical chemistry. I was analyzing soil samples, water samples, um, things that came out of the, the plants there in northwest Arkansas um, and I got a lot of experience in doing industrial scale type chemistry analysis uh, and back in, back in the day, uh, minimum wage was $3 and something and I was making six fifty, so it felt really great. I mean, I know that doesn't seem like a lot of money now, but it's been uh, 30 years, so, uh, but I, that, that's how I got my, my, my start. I picked up the phone book and got lucky. That won't happen for everybody, right? You all have to really probably network a little bit more than that these days uh, to, to make this type of stuff happen. So. You know, and I didn't have to worry about Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff back then, so there was nothing that they could really, really look up. All right, so we had a video for you to watch on resumes. It was a very short video. So tell me some things about resumes. What were some of the pieces of advice that they gave on the video or from career services? 
no objective statement. And why is that? They are vague. And I'll tell you what, uh, I look at a lot, I mean, we hire a lot of people all the time, people come and go, uh, and when I get a resume that has an objective statement, it quite frequently turns me off. Not because it's so vague, but because the objective will say something like, this is my goal in life, and I'm like, that has nothing to do with this job. So I automatically think you have other aspirations other than to be in my office doing X, Y, or Z. You're probably not going to be around very long. It's not a good fit right so what I would recommend you do as opposed to putting in an objective statement is to always provide a cover letter with your resume what does a cover letter do for us what is a cover letter why do we call it a cover letter it's on the front. That's right. It used to be on the cover of the packet that we put together. We don't put these packets together anymore, but we still call it a cover letter. What's important about a cover letter? That's the opportunity. For, go ahead. No, no, please, please. You're about to say something. That's right. It is a one pager for you to sell yourself um, to to the um, to the potential employer, or whatever the case may be. And I will tell you, um, I spend, and you know, this is just me, but I spend more time looking at the cover letter than I do the CV or resume. Uh, if the cover letter is well written, if the cover letter is matched to my the position that I've posted. Um, then I put that in the let's consider pile. If that cover letter starts talking about things that aren't germane to the position that I have posted, I put that in the let's not consider pile. Uh, they may be perfectly qualified to be in my position that I have posted, but they're over here talking about, you know, they want to be a, a faculty member somewhere someday, and I'm like, but I'm trying to hire a staff member. <laughs> That's not going to be a fit, right? So. If I've got a pool full of people who fit, why would I be looking at a pool of people that don't really have a fit, right? So it is your one page opportunity to, to uh, really sell yourself for the position. So you all can have one CV or one resume, but you can have multiple cover letters, right? So if you are applying to a job, you know, let's say here at the institution and it's gonna be in the Office of Scholarships, for example, you want to focus that cover letter on that position. That's, that's what you want to do. And you want to be able to tie in your experiences from your resume into why you're going to be a best fit. That's what you're going to be talking about in that cover letter. And it needs to be about a page. Okay? If something is really short, that usually gives me pause. If it's way too long, that gives me pause. About a page, double spaced, is about, is about right. Uh, for, for a cover letter, in my opinion. Okay? What else should we do or not do with a resume? Uh, you should have your bragging points, your main points that you want your possible employer to see, like bullet point or like very okay. easy to... Let's just call them the high points. How about that? And that's going to include things like achievements, right? going to include things like skills uh, and you're going to want to make sure that those things are there. You all worked very hard to acquire the skills and your achievements. Sell them, right? You, you had something to say. Um, yeah, uh, like most of my life, every time I talk about resumes, they say keep it short and sweet, never go into too much detail. Yeah, so a resume, again, as you were told, you know, they're going to spend a very short period of time looking at it. You don't want them digging through a lot of material. So for a resume, keep keep it short to the point. Right? Keep it short and to the point. This brings up the difference of, of a resume and a CV, a curriculum vita. What's the difference in a resume and a curriculum vita?
What I posted, is it a resume or is it a curriculum vita? It is a curriculum vita. In the academic world, we deal with CVs, not resumes. If you're an academic. Now, if you're, if you're applying for a staff position, of course, they, they deal with resumes. What, so why, why the difference? That's right. A, a, a CV is a very detailed resume as a way to think about it. The, there's going to be some components of both that are identical, and we'll get to those in a moment. But a CV, if you go in and look at my CV, and what I've posted is actually an abbreviated CV, but, you know, for the type of position that I'm in, you know, I'm going to list every uh, academic presentation I've ever done. I'm going to tell people whether or not I was invited to give that presentation or not. I'm going to put every publication that I have published on that resume, things that I have done in my career, the things that I have advanced, I'm going to do that. I would not put that on a CV, or excuse me, on a resume, right? I would focus on the skills, my education, yada, 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 in a resume, but I would not put everything I've done. Now, if you go and look at my resume, or my CV, you will see that it goes back to about 1999. Long time, right? And if I printed the whole thing out, it would be about 25 or 30 pages in length. Okay? But I've been doing this for a long time, right? So what do you all need to be preparing at this point, a resume or a CV? A resume, yep. Yeah, but that should, over time, evolve into your CV. For those of you who intend to go on and be professionals uh, in chemistry, you're going to want to have a CV, even if you go into industry. Yeah. Like now, like now. And in fact, we were, you know, you're going to have an assignment. One of the things that you leave with from this class is a resume slash CV. It will look more like a resume right now. It'll probably be a couple of pages in length for you all. You will probably include some stuff from high school because you're, you know, you're that close to, to uh, just having finished high school. So things that you did, activities that you did in high school at this point in your career are okay to include. If you go back to my CV, you'll see that I have excluded all of that stuff at this point. It's just not relevant anymore. You know, I graduated in 1990. <laughs> okay, you all weren't even born yet, right? Um, but, um, you know, I wouldn't put on my, on my CV resume that I, you know, that I went to Boy State and that I played football and, but I would have, you know, on my resume when I was looking for a job when I was 19 or 20 years old, I would have put that kind of stuff on there then. But now it's, it's just no longer relevant. Okay. So, what are the things that must be on every resume or CV? Pardon? Yeah, you got to start off with your personal information, right? Personal info. What does that include other than the name? Education. Well, we'll get to that. Uh, just, just your personal information right now, but we'll definitely get to your education. We'll talk about that in a moment. Where you're from slash live. Okay. Phone Address, number. phone number. Email. Email. Email's a very important one. That's how they're probably going to communicate with you. I know many of you don't like to deal with email. You're going to have to. What do you need to pay attention to in your email? Yeah, so again, whether this is right or wrong, it's irrelevant. It's just, a, it's just a fact. Do not use your cutesy email name. You all probably have an email at Gmail or whatever that is, you know, something, to, you know, I don't want to even say, but I've seen a lot of them that just really kind of set me off, right, as a professional. I see this on professional. You don't want to do that. You know, you do not want to, you know, your email address to be prettyunicorns at gmail.com, okay? If you have one of those that all of your friends use, that is perfectly fine. That's your personal business. But you need to create another account that is professional. Usually your entire name, you know, like mine is douglas.masterson at usm.edu, right? You do want to avoid some of the older email 
uh, services like uh, Yahoo um, that typically sends a message that you're not up with the, the times. Uh, Gmail is fine, uh, of course, you, but right now you can use your USM email address, right? I mean, if you were, that's probably what you all use a lot. That would be perfectly fine. That is a perfectly fine and professional email address. Do you want to include anything about your social media handles? I would not. I would avoid it, unless you have a LinkedIn. A lot of people will include their LinkedIn information. That is perfectly fine. LinkedIn can be an extension of your personal resume. Right? If you have a well curated LinkedIn page, and I don't, I mean, I have a LinkedIn, but I don't keep mine up to date every day. I mean, I've, I've got a job, I'm happy with my job, I'm not looking for a job. Uh, but I don't, I don't post my political stuff on LinkedIn. I don't post uh, pictures of the parties that I go to on LinkedIn. I keep it, I keep it professional. It's just that my posts are kind of infrequent. Uh, but one of the nice things about LinkedIn is you can also post badges. So as you acquire skills through various uh, sources, that you can actually get a badge that goes on LinkedIn for some of these things and that shows the employer, oh, I can do X, Y, or Z. We offer badges at this institution called proficiency badges uh, that um, you, can, you can do in some programs and those would be good things to put. Or if you had a certificate, you know, if you got a data analytics certificate or something like that, you would want that on LinkedIn uh, listed as well. All right, so be very careful about emails on your personal info. Now let's move into education, right? So we, you're going to have your personal info. You're probably going to then go to your education. Again, the education is going to be something that somebody wants to see is what they're studying or have studied germane to what I, I'm asking somebody to do, right? Okay. So what will you all include right now on your resume for education? Yeah, you can include all of that. You will notice on my uh, CV that I've posted, I do not include my high school. It's just, it's just again, that is something that will eventually fall off for you. You know, unless you went to a high school, you know, where you, you know, just, I mean, did something extraordinary, you know, you're probably not gonna, gonna list that kind of thing. And I can't even think of an example of what that would be. Um, so uh, that's probably what you're going to have. So how are you going to list that information? You're just going to say that I went to Northwest, whatever, high school, graduated in 2018, whatever, whenever, 2020, 2021? All right, so for mine, I've got like my name and stuff at the top, and there's a line that says education in bold, and under that, I've got University of Southern Miss, mm -hmm. and then the Yeah. Under that Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry, over to the right, I've got where that is, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and the expect, expected graduation. That's, that's perfectly fine at this point. Yep, that's perfectly fine. What about listing your GPAs? Is that something you want to do? If it's good. If it's good? That's yeah. right. Really, really good? Yeah, what I will tell you, if it is absent, people will ask you questions about that. So there is nothing wrong with leaving it off, but um, in an interview, you know, people, people will start to look more closely at your transcript if you leave it off. You know, my rule of thumb, you know, if you've got a 3.5 or, or greater, you definitely want to include it. A 3.0 or greater is okay. Below that, I would probably leave it off. Uh, but know that people will start to ask you, ask you questions, um, and or probably spend more time looking at your, at your, uh, at your transcript when you submit it. Because sometimes, you know, for jobs they want you to submit a transcript as well. Okay. So we've got our personal information. We've got education. What else are you going to include? None of you at this point, I don't think, have a bachelor's degree, right? So as he mentioned, listing your expected date of graduation would be important. Uh, and then you can also, at this point, you could probably list specific courses uh, that you have uh, 
um, taken and passed uh, if you were to look for a job. So if you were, I don't know, let's say you were going down the street to our local analytical lab, we do have one, uh, and you wanted to get a summer job, you know, it would be nice for them to probably know that you've taken Gen Chem and, you've, you know, if you've taken organic or whatever, they'd want to probably know that, uh, and so that would be okay. Later on, after you get your degrees, those things will fall off. You will not, you will not keep those on there. Yeah. So would you just do that for USM, like the school that you're currently enrolled in? Um, so you have an associate's degree? I, I would probably include the most germane classes to the position. So if you were to, again, to go down there, and you know, let's say you take, took Gen Chem and whatever there, I would probably list that. Would I list the Englishes and the histories? Not unless I was looking for a job that required that, right? Uh, I, would, I, would, I would only keep it to, to that kind of stuff. So let's pull up, and I don't know why I've got two copies in here. I, I, I know I uploaded it twice because it looked like it didn't take the first time, but I guess it did. Um, let it generate a view here. Come on, Canvas. There we go. So what you'll see is that I've got my name, I've got my rank, uh, because that's important for us. I've got my phone number. What phone number have I listed here? That's not my cell number. That's the school's number, that's right. It's up to you but I usually don't list my personal cell number. Now, you all would need to do that probably at the, at the moment because you don't have another, another place to list. But I don't because I don't want, uh, I don't want uh, employers potentially selling my information. So I avoid that. Notice that my email address is there and I've made it linkable. I did that so that if they wanted to get in touch with me really quick, they could just click on that, it opens up their email application and they can send me an email. That is not required, but it is something that I do. You'll see that I've got my education, right? My major, my supporting areas. In my case, I had a dissertation, so I listed the title of that dissertation. Uh, and then I was also a postdoctoral associate, so I listed that information there as well. I then moved into my professional positions, right? You're probably going to avoid that at the moment. Um, in terms of calling it professional positions, you may have positions listed, especially if you did stuff that was kind of germane to, to the positions that you're looking for. I listed then my licensures and certifications. Those are kind of important things for us. Professional memberships. Will you all be listing any professional memberships? How many of you are members of professional societies at this point? Okay, I would list them. I would list them. So if you're members of the ACS Student Affiliates, I would list that. Uh, if you're a member of Phi Kappa Phi, uh, you know, some kind of honorary uh, societies, you're going to want to list that kind of, of stuff. Uh, and I always list the dates. Um, I don't think that's absolutely necessary. Uh, I list then awards and honors. You're going to want to list those. That's very important. Those are achievements, right? You're going to want to list your awards and honors. So any awards at this point that you got when you were in high school, so if you, you know, were valedictorian, sal salutatorian, um, if you were a member of the Honor Society, if you were a uh, club, whatever, president, those are the kinds of things that you're going to probably want to list, okay? And you'll see my list is, well, just because I've been here for quite a while. And, uh, media appearances and interviews, probably not going to be there for you. I've listed my publications. Okay, so again, many of you probably don't have publications at this point, so you won't, won't put that piece on there. But some of you may have done presentations. Why is it important to list presentations? What skill is that telling people? 
That's right, your ability to speak. That is a key um, piece that's part of our GEC, right? We have a speaking requirement for our GEC as well as a writing requirement. Why do we have those as part of our general education curriculum? Because employers always tell us students are coming out of college knowing their discipline pretty well, but they can't communicate it and they can't write about it. And that's an important piece of what is, uh, is required of just about any job these days okay you're going to have to be able to communicate what you do uh, and so you want to list those types of things uh, there as well okay and that list for me is I give a lot of talks every year um, for me I've got contracts grants sponsored research things that I have gotten funded over the years to do a variety of, of different things um, my research activities listed, the types of projects that I'm working on. You all might be getting involved in a lab. If you're getting involved in a lab early, you would definitely want to list that uh, there as well. And then I, I also list my directed student learning. That is, you know, whose honors thesis committee am I on? Whose graduate committees am I on? Et cetera, et cetera. That's very important for my area of work. That won't be important for you all because you all don't do that. Uh, being a faculty member, teaching innovation and curriculum development is very important. I've listed that information. Professional development activities attended. What might you use for professional development activities? Seminars. Seminars. Very good. So if you all went to a career fair seminar about how to, you know, you might want to list that there, right? That's a good thing. Uh, you know, if you took some sort of uh, professional etiquette course that would be a professional development activity you might want to list that there as well um, so quite a bit of that kind of stuff for me and then service okay service is another important thing at the university but it's important overall what might you all count as service uh, volunteer. volunteer work at your, at your point in life right now, an employer will look to that quite a bit, actually. They'll, they will want to look at your, um, your service or your volunteer. And you can word it as volunteer. You don't have to call it service if you don't want to. But what might you include there? Volunteer work with your church, civic community stuff. Um, you know, if you do something for Habitat for Humanity or the American Red Cross, you're going to want to do that. Employers want to know that you're going to be a good civic citizen, right, to the community. Uh, do you have to have a bunch of stuff? No. And for those of you going to medical school, this is a critical piece of what you need to be doing now. You cannot get into medical school unless you do some volunteer work. I don't care what your GPA is or what your MCAT score is. If you haven't done any volunteer work, if you haven't shown some ability to be selfless, they're not going to take you, okay? Uh, and it is better to get started on that now. Now, my advice to you is to find one or two service activities or volunteer activities that you really enjoy and do them year over year. Build a track record of commitment to that cause. Uh, when I look at a pre-med CV or resume, and that goes, I did this once, and I did that once, and I did that once, and I served at the soup kitchen once. You know, it starts to look like all you're doing is trying to, to impress me with a long list as opposed to impressing me with a commitment. Okay, so it's much better, in my opinion, to show a commitment to a cause or a volunteer activity as opposed to having a list that's uh, 50 miles long. So would you still list? I, 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 oh, I would. Oh, I would. But at the end of the day, you know, you need to have something that shows a commitment to something that you're passionate about. That's really what they're after. And if it's for you, Habitat for Humanity, you know, if every year you went and worked on a house, that shows a commitment to, to that particular thing. And it shows a, a, a passion for that area, right? And it gives you something that you can really hang your hat on. Now you can 
you know, every year do something for Habitat for Humanity, but maybe one year you did something for Christian services at the, at the soup kitchen down the road, right? I mean, you can do that one time, uh, and that would be okay. I'm talking about if you have a long list of just one time, one event for an hour or two, uh, it doesn't really show a commitment. Okay? Um, and, that, and we break ours down into professional service and university service and public service and, and that kind of stuff. But you, you probably won't be doing that. So this example that I have here is how many pages long? Where do I see the pages? Yeah, that, that's pretty long, right? Uh, and that's not everything. That doesn't include my teaching. Uh, so if I was to apply for another faculty position, I would include my teaching as well in there, what courses I've taught over time and yada, yada, yada. Okay? What can you tell me about this um, in terms of how it's formatted? Is it formatted well? It's organized. Notice I'm not using a lot of flair in my fonts. I'm not using a lot of color. Right? In fact, I'm using no color. Why, do, why does one need to be cautious about a lot of fancy fonts and color? It doesn't look professional. Okay, it may not look professional, depending on, on the choice. Right? What else? It can look chaotic. It can look chaotic. It can look like you're trying to impress with fluff as opposed to facts. Right? What else? Don't forget that there are people who are colorblind. It's actually not that uncommon. So if you're using a lot of red, green kind of stuff, uh, you know, in other words, don't make your resume or your CV look like a Christmas tree, okay? Uh, because when you, when you try to do that, uh, you know, you can, you can really put some people off. I would recommend a Times New Roman font, an Arial font, maybe Tahoma, uh, something like that. I would not pick one of the ones that look like somebody's writing, you know, a signature or anything like that. Some of them can get quite hard to read, okay? Uh, notice the use of bold. It is okay to bold, but if you bold everything, then nothing is bolded, okay? You bold for effect. What am I bolding? I am bolding headings. Things that I want that person to be drawn to quickly, right? The very first thing that I want them to be drawn to quickly is me. Dr. Douglas S. Masterson, right? Education, professional positions. I want them to be able to find those things quickly, okay? Is there an order to my organization? You bet. Because I do know, especially in a CV where it's multiple pages, People are going to look at it a lot, you know. They may look at it for a little bit longer, but what's on that first page or two needs to be your most important stuff. Notice I put service at the end. Why did I put service at the end? I put service at the end because in my line of work, that's, while it's important, it is the least important thing for a consideration for an academic job, okay? Now, if, that was, if I was going to go and try to get a job with a nonprofit organization where volunteerism and working with volunteers is very, very important, where would I have put it? Closer to the top, right? So you can, you can do that kind of stuff. The good news for me is we actually have software at the institution called Faculty Success that allows me to keep track of my resume and my CV. So every time I do something, I just put it in the system and it builds the re updates the resume for me. You all will build a resume in this class. You all need to build a resume that you're willing to update and keep as you go forward, whether you stay in this major or not. Um, and you will need to update it regularly. What would regularly be for you all? Every semester. Every semester. I would update it every semester. Why do you need to keep it updated regularly? Because if you don't, you will forget things that you have done and you will leave those important things off. And let's suppose you um, get ready to go to a job fair and the uh, person, whoever behind the, the desk says, send me, you know, and they've got your resume. And they say, well, I need you to send me an updated one. 
I noticed the last thing on here was a year ago. I need you to send me an updated one. And you don't have it? What's that going to communicate? It's going to communicate that either A, you're not prepared, or B, you haven't done anything since that last <laughs> update. Probably, which is not true, right? I mean, so you want to keep these things up to date as much as possible. Also, from time to time, you will get, you may get a email from somebody like the, the school chair or director, and they may say, hey, we've got some scholarship money that we're trying to find a home for. Can you all send me your resume? If it's an updated, well-formatted resume, you're already in a better running than the folks that have to sit down and put it together, right? So being timely is, is a great way to, to do this. How should you submit your resume? When people ask you for it, I always tell people to submit it as a PDF. Don't submit it as a Word doc. Don't submit it as a Pages doc. Okay, why is that? PDF is universal, and it's pretty darn good at preserving your formatting across platforms. I had somebody submit a resume to me for a position that we had. They wrote it in a, in a uh, I think it was Pages uh, or Open Office. I can't remember. But anyway, it was, it was written in a software package that I didn't have on my desktop computer. And when I opened it up, the formatting went, whoop. Now that's not their fault, obviously. They probably had it formatted, but now I'm having to struggle to figure out how everything's together and trying to figure out whether or not the individual actually could put together a good document. So always submit things as PDFs when somebody asks you for an electronic copy of your CV or resume. All right, so you all are going to be doing a CV, or excuse me, a resume project uh, that I will have posted um, this week uh, for you all. Let me see if I can get out of that. There we go. All right. So what was important about the Nobel Prize this past week? They did. So, what is click chemistry? Anybody know? So, from what I read, and well, I didn't go too deep into it. But no, that's fine. <clears throat> so, they take like the little, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, what's the word? The molecules. So, you got the molecules. And then there's like, it's like a, there's like a circle that goes around and like clicks the individual pieces together. So, you can like see how the molecule like builds as like you add things to it. Okay. Yeah, that, that is one, one method of click. Yeah. Yeah. So click chemistry is a term that was actually coined, I believe, by Barry Sharpless, uh, one of the Nobel Prize winners. Uh, and basically what it means in general is that you take two molecules and they connect together without any byproducts. All right. And so they, and they come together very, very easily uh, under, under easy circumstances. And he developed that concept and then uh, Bertozzi, who I think, in, in, in my personal opinion, deserves more of the credit for the Nobel Prize than anybody, uh, simply because she was able to advance the usefulness of the click chemistry looking at what's going on inside a cell. So imagine the possibility of taking two molecules that together are not therapeutic, getting them into the cell, and then using click chemistry to connect them together to make the therapeutic. That has enormous potential. We're not exactly there yet, right? But you all know, uh, you know, people that have undergone chemotherapy and things like that, and they get sick, and it's because it's, you know, it attacks other cells. But imagine if you could deliver both things to a cell and then click them together, and then they become active only in that area. That would be awesome, right? That would be very, very good. And so there's a lot of work being done on that kind of stuff. And that couldn't have been done without this concept of click. Okay? And, you know, you all are going to learn when you get into your organic classes or higher level classes that there's a lot of reactions that give a lot of byproducts. Essentially, there are no byproducts in click chemistry. I mean, that, that is one of the very um, interesting things about it. Okay? So what was special about Barry Sharpless? 
Uh, he has received the award in chemistry twice. Uh, there are very few people who have won the Nobel twice, and I don't know them all. But interestingly enough, back in the early 1900s, Mary Curie, Adam Curie, won the Nobel Prize twice, once in chemistry, once in physics. But still, nonetheless, won them twice. Um, you know, and that's just amazing to think back in the early 1900s that a female scientist was able to win the Nobel Prize twice. Uh, fantastic, right? Fantastic opportunity there. Uh, and, but yet it was many, many years <laughs> uh, until the next Nobel had been given uh, in sciences um, to a woman, which was, which was unfortunate. There's been a lot of females uh, along the way who have contributed significantly. And there are a number of people who feel that um, the Nobel should have been shared uh, with Rosalind, what was her last name? I can't remember, but anyway, for, for the discovery of, of the helical structure of DNA. Uh, and I, th I think that that should be uh, acknowledged. Um, so yeah, Sharpless won the first Nobel Prize back in 2001, I believe, uh, for his asymmetric epoxidation reactions. Um, you don't need to worry about what that is. I was a um, postdoc in 2001 when he won the Nobel Prize. And Sharpless had come to Vanderbilt and talked not long before he had actually won the Nobel Prize. So I got to meet Barry Sharpless uh, briefly. Um, and for him to actually have won a second Nobel Prize is, is pretty impressive. Um, he is an interesting character, to, to say the least. Um, you might have gotten some of that from the short videos. Um, but I wanted you to see the short videos, of course. Um, the guy from Denmark, it's all in his native tongue, which was hard for us to understand. But, you know, just the excitement around the institutions where these people won the Nobels, um, you know, it, it's, it's phenomenal. So, very, very good work. All right, we're going to start having some readings out of this um, book called The Chemistry Book, which highlights a variety of significant accomplishments over the centuries uh, about uh, things that uh, had come up about uh, chemistry. What is this concept of polywater? Why did I pick this one? Do we actually have poly water? No. We do not have poly water, right? So why do you think I picked something from 1966 as something to start off you all with in reading these, these things? That doesn't sound like much of an accomplishment. They proved that poly water didn't exist, right? So why would I, why would I pick this one? Take a guess. To show that like, like when a scientist learns something, that's right. That's right. Science is a process. And right now you are living in a time where, and you all have seen this during COVID, where science changes. In the sense, and that, that's actually not the correct way to say it, right? Science doesn't really change, but our, but our knowledge and our ability to draw conclusions changes over time. And I think it's a very big shame that you have scientists who went out and made claims with the data that they knew, and then as that changed, got hammered. Well, now you're changing your mind. That's the whole point of science. <laughs> it is a facts, evidence-driven enterprise. And when COVID came out, we had a certain set of facts that seemed to point in one direction. Early on, you might remember, it's probably not a good idea to wear a mask because you've got your hands all around your face and that might contribute to, to the spread. Then they came out a few months later and said, no, we think now wearing the mask actually has a benefit over not wearing the mask. And you saw politicians and everybody just hammer these people. They can't make up their mind. The data changed. We saw changes in the information. 
you have to be willing to look at the evidence and call BS on it sometimes. That's what it means to be a scientist. A scientist is not somebody who takes their belief and then fits the facts to fit that. We look at the facts and change our beliefs based on what the evidence tells us. It is an iterative process. That's what I wanted you to take from this. They made legitimate observations about this water in this little capillary. It looked like it was more viscous. It looked like it was behaving differently. The boiling point was clearly different. Oh my gosh, maybe water has polymerized under these conditions. And they went out and shared that with the world. That was an enormous claim. And enormous claims require enormous amounts of evidence. If you make a grandiose claim, you better have grandiose evidence to support it. That's the fundamental piece of science that you all need to know about. And next, well not next week, the week after we will talk about the scientific method a bit, okay? But I wanted you to see this because this is the scientific method at work. Just because I go into the lab and I do something and I publish it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the absolute truth. Right? So when my graduate student comes to me and says, I found a paper, you know what the first thing I ask him is? How many people have cited that paper? Well, nobody cited that paper. Well, how old is it? What's well, a 10-year-old paper? Nobody cited it. Maybe it's BS. <laughs> now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's BS. But if he has this paper that's 10 years old and hasn't been cited versus this paper that is 10 years old and has been cited by 100 people, which one am I going to believe more? And he says, well, I've got this way of making what we need to make, or I've got this way of making. Which one am I going to tell him to try? The one that has the more evidence, right? That's the scientific method at work. Okay? That's the scientific method at work. It's very, very important to critically evaluate everything that you get ready to use in science. You all go into classes right now and you trust what the professors are telling you. You should, as you move along, start to question your professors more and more in class. Call BS on some things. It's okay, right? It is a process. That's the point that I wanted you to take from this. Science is open by definition. Other scientists started to do the evaluation and started to come up with the fact that these original claims had to be incorrect. What did they ultimately decide on? No such thing as poly water. And it turns out that it, looked, that it appeared that the original samples were actually contaminated. Well, you all know if you add something to water, it gets thicker, right? That can explain the viscous nature. You know that if you add things like salts to water that the boiling point goes up. You learn, you're learning that in general chemistry, right? All of those physical properties change. And so an original observation that had a grandiose claim turns out again to be false. In my time, that was cold fusion. Uh, when I was sitting in your chair, uh, two scientists, Pons and Fleischmann, came out and said, we found an easy way to create cold fusion. And it created this big, big hoodoo. And in fact, at the ACS National Com uh, Convention, which is held twice a year, they actually did this brown bag special where they brought everybody in and they started talking about, oh my gosh, we may have solved the energy crisis by just using a little heavy water, some palladium metal, and a little current, and we get all this energy. Turns out that was a huge claim based on very little evidence that turned out to be totally baloney. Okay? Uh, now, Pons and Fleischmann were actually very good scientists. They got emotional and excited about one observation that seemed to suggest cold fusion. Turns out cold fusion had nothing to do with it. Okay, uh, so one needs to be very skeptical as a scientist. Uh, that is your job, is to be a skeptic uh, as a scientist, okay? And so that's one of the uh, characteristics that I really like about being a scientist. You know, I, 
I tell my boss all the time, or my previous boss before he retired, he would say, do you believe that? And I said, I don't have to believe that. We're going to do the experiment. <laughs> you know, do you believe if we do X, Y, and Z, that's going to do what we think it's going to do here at the university? I said, that's our hypothesis, and we're going to test it. Things suggest that this will happen if we make this policy change, but we're going to do the experiment. And if it turns out that it doesn't work, we need to step back from it and change. That's what it means to be a scientist. Okay? And if you really like that kind of stuff, you're going to be a good scientist. Uh, and if you don't, uh, it's going to be a tough road for you <laughs> uh, because that is science. And that is also important to be a physician. Some doctors will say, well, I'm not a scientist, I'm a physician. But if you think about it, physicians really do the scientific method in, in the office. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks, making the connections. Okay. Any questions about today? All right, well, I'm going to give you four minutes of your life back. It's good seeing you all, and I will see you all later. Thank you. Thank you.